Anyone who loves astrophotography knows that excitement when you're looking forward to a night that's going to be clear as a bell. And I always make sure to take advantage of such nights and have the telescope set up well in advance. I'm fortunate to live in an area with no light pollution. Unfortunately, there is often cloud cover to deal with, as well as humidity in the night sky. This night, however, was going to be crystal clear, except for the unfortunate reality of a 99% full moon. But, thanks to the advances of modern technology, that needn't be a roadblock on doing some astrophotography. And I decided not only to image some dim but beautiful nebulae, but also to try out a recent acquisition, ZWO's Duo Bandpass Filter. And a particularly beautiful and challenging test for this night would be the Veil Nebula. In particular, the Eastern Veil, which we'll take a look at shortly. But right here, you are seeing the Veil Nebula through the eye of the Hubble Telescope. Recent estimates place the Veil Nebula at about 2400 light years away. And from our vantage here on Earth, it appears to be in the Cygnus constellation. Though this video from the European Space Agency helps us to perceive its actual location better. In terms of astronomical objects, the Veil Nebula is an extremely interesting subject. For one, it is huge, 130 light years in diameter, occupying three full degrees of the night sky. This means the Veil Nebula occupies as much of the sky as six full moons side by side, or some 30 full moons in total. That is impressive when you consider it as 2400 light years away. It is also a particularly beautiful and interesting subject because unlike emission nebulas, which pretty much glow red, the Veil Nebula appears to be composed of luminous ribbons of energy. Those luminous ribbons are various elements of stellar and interstellar gas. Here, we can perceive another close-up of the Veil Nebula created by the Hubble Telescope when it imaged a very small region approximately three light years long. That might seem like a lot, but it is just a tiny portion of one of the Veil Nebula's many structures. According to most recent estimates by NASA, the Veil Nebula was created when a massive star 20 times the size of our Sun went supernova 8,000 years ago. Long before it went nova, as it was dying, it blew off huge amounts of its matter into space. And when it finally did go nova, the star blew up with incredible power and would possibly have been, for a time, the brightest object in our galaxy. So bright it would have outshone Venus from Earth. And early humans would have seen it. When the star went supernova, its outer shell blasted away at 600,000 kilometers per hour. This material ran into elements released earlier by the star, intertwined with and superheated them. And all that material, caught up in the star's blast, continued to accelerate out into space. There are many interstellar gases in that region of space, so there was a lot more material for the supernova shock front to run into. The shock front continued to run into material at the incredible speed of 600,000 kilometers per hour, creating sufficient energy to heat that material up to millions of degrees. And the glow that we now see coming from the Veil Nebula is the result of that material cooling off. The Veil Nebula is considered to be a middle-aged supernova remnant. In time, over another 10 to 30,000 years, it will expand, dissipate, and fade away and much of that material blown away from its parent star so long ago, perhaps becoming part of new stars and planets. I gathered light on another nebula till about 2 a.m., at which time I swung the telescope around to focus on the eastern veil. These days I mostly navigate the scope through plate solving via Nina, and is generally fast and reliable. However, plate solving is easily thrown off by noise. So if there is noise in the pictures, whether it's created by light pollution or the full moon, it's a good idea to bin your camera by 2x2 two two or even 3x3. Three three. This will effectively increase the signal-to-noise ratio, basically drowning out the noise. I find if I just bin my camera by 2x2, two two, even under a full moon, Nina very quickly and easily plate solves. If you're using Nina, you can easily preset the camera for binning while plate solving in the options. The moon was up by then, and shining powerfully. However, a few test one-minute exposures, light stretched in Nina, revealed that ZWO's Duo Bandpass filter was very effectively blotting out the moonlight. And the Veil Nebula came in wonderfully beautifully. In fact, the only problem I had was satellites. That region of the sky seemed to be Satellite City that night. And for about 15 to 20 minutes, I took one-minute images watching satellite after satellite trace across the image so persistently that I contemplated giving up on the veil that night. 
I think the next big problem for astrophotographers is going to be satellite pollution. But then the satellite seemed to vanish and I decided to go ahead and use the rest of this valuable night to go ahead and try to image the veil. As noted earlier, the veil is much too big to image in a single pass with even a relatively low focal length scope such as my 450mm refractor. So I decided to image one portion of the eastern veil and then tackle another portion another night. As I've said before, I have a strong preference for using Nina to do most of this work. I can run all of my drivers and apps through Nina and not have to jump from one app to another through the evening. However, I wish the developers would give more sophisticated manual control of the camera, the shooting experience as a whole in Nina, because to be honest, I don't much care for the sequencing feature. I understand it was created to automate everything so you could set up your mount, your autofocuser, your rotator, your filter turner, everything to go automatically at night so you can set up your telescope to shoot an image and you can go to bed or whatnot. But I'm a big believer in Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will. So I prefer to just stay up and monitor things. And you can do that with Nina, but unfortunately the controls we presently have to operate the astro cams or regular cams, whatever it is that you're using in terms of a camera, the controls we have are pretty basic. You can set your exposure length and your gain, set it to loop photos or not photos, save photos or not save them, and that's pretty much it right now. But Nina's always under development and uh, constantly improving significantly, so I'm sure that'll be addressed in time. For two hours, I gathered subs of 420 seconds at 181 gain. 180 is unity gain for the Player One Uranus C camera. This is a color camera, and currently my only astro camera. I do hope to get a good mono next year and a set of filters to go along with it. That was the plan for last year, but uh, a big hurricane creating a lot of home damage that needed work forced setting aside some of those plans. Regardless, I have to say, I am deeply impressed with Player One cameras. I have two of them. I not only have the Uranus C, but I have their Xena M, which is their best guiding camera. And I find they both do beautiful jobs. In particular, the Uranus C is very low noise. When taking calibration frames, I haven't even found a reason to shoot darks. Overall, imaging went very well. I stopped once at 70 minutes in just to run an autofocus routine. I live in Canada and nighttime temperatures here can change quickly. Changes in temperature can easily affect focus. But Nita's autofocus routine quickly put things back where they should be. And the ZWO Duo Bandpass filter worked like a charm. In every frame, it virtually scrubbed the moonlight from the sky. It was almost exactly a quarter after 5 a.m. that dawn began to happen. And it was time to call it a night. Or maybe I should say a morning. But we got a lot of good data. Ever since shooting that, I've been hoping for the opportunity to get the rest of the Eastern Veil. But there hasn't been a clear night yet. That's how it is in Eastern Canada. We could have weeks of clear skies. Or we could have weeks of clouds. Most days, it's a bit of both. So you take what you can get, and you shoot when you can. Still, I'm pretty happy with the results here. I stacked them as usual in Cyril, did most of the editing in Cyril, and then I do something with my images that I don't think most people do. I'm a big fan of Affinity Photo, which is very similar to Adobe Photoshop, but with a much, much lower price tag. I can tell you though, if you've never used it, I think they give you a 30 day trial. I'm not trying to sell it, I don't represent them. But if you know how to use Photoshop, you'll figure out how to use Affinity Photo in minutes. Very, very powerful editor. So I like to stack my images in Cyril and do the majority of the editing there. Beginning with a green removal, color balance, then using StarNet to remove the stars, then stretching the histogram to get everything up to the brightness that I want and applying a few other corrections and calibrations to get the stars and the nebulae looking pretty much like I want them. However, I don't rejoin the star mask with the DSO mask in Cyril. I like to then take them over to Affinity Photo, which has extremely powerful noise removal tools and also more powerful compositing tools. In Affinity Photo, I remove any color and luminance noise using its tools. It does a very thorough, beautiful job. Then I'll do some final touch-ups to the separate images and then composite them back together. Affinity Photo offers about a couple dozen different ways of compositing things. And you can simply pass your mouse over each composite option and see an instant preview of what the finished image will look like. But after about 45 minutes of manually stacking and image calibration in Cyril, and then some final noise removal, a little color and luminance tweaking in Affinity, and recompositing the separated star and DSO object images, 
we get this finished product. I think it's okay for just 140 minutes of data shot on top of a full moon. Hopefully the weather will cooperate soon so that I can collect more data and further refine this image and finish shooting the other part of it. Thank you to everyone who has joined me on the Sky Story channel to study astronomy and astrophotography. I am floored, humbled, and dismayed at how rapidly this channel has grown. Since I put up the first video only a couple months ago, we're already at a thousand subscribers. I, I thank everybody that has shown up for this. There'll be plenty more videos on both astrophotography and astronomy. Those two amazing endeavors that illuminate the nature of the cosmos and the beauty of it for us all. As well, we'll continue to peer into the efforts of organizations such as NASA and the European Space Agency, as well as the endeavors of private individuals and astronomy clubs to tell the story of the sky.